Okay. So I hope that I'm clear. Yeah. So I'm going to give a short talk today. Uh, my name is Elvis Ongonga from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. And also I'm here in Maladari University in Sweden under the support of International Science Program. So I'm going to give a short talk on the topic uh, low dimensional homely algebras. So uh, the talk will entail uh, some preliminaries on some definitions on how these algebras uh, came to be. And then we shall also look on uh, isomorphism problems, how to construct uh, equivalence classes or on these algebras. And then finally, we will see how, how do we realize them. As we go on dimensions higher, are we sure that we will still end up with these algebras always? So, I will first begin by defining a Lie algebra and uh, the vector spaces that we are going to work on or uh, the field that we are going to define everything on is uh, algebraically closed and also of characteristics zero. So a Lie algebra is a vector space uh, endowed with a, a bilinear product or a bilinear map, uh, normally referred to as uh, the Lie bracket, satisfying two main conditions. And here condition one is referred to as the skew symmetric condition, so that if you multiply x and y, it's just the minus of y and x. Mm -hmm. And then the second condition is referred to as the Jacobi identity. So this means Jacobi identity is you, if you sum up this in this way, in a cyclic permutation way, so you start with x, y, and z, then y, z, and x plus z, x, and y, you always get zero. So if you have these two properties achieved, then we have a, a Lie algebra for all elements in the vector space. So I'll give an example. Uh, this uh, favorite example of simple Lie algebra. So if you define uh, a set of all two by two matrices over C, uh, which are traceless or whose trace is zero, and then you define this Lie bracket, or now what we refer to as our bilinear product, as a as commutator or a commuting relationship. So the, the product of two matrices is just given by the difference of the usual products. So it's just the usual multiplication of matrices. So this is a Lie algebra. Uh, this is a three dimensional Lie algebra. Uh, if we define the basis, say X, Y, and Z uh, in these matrices, so we see they are trace zero. If you add the diagonal elements, we end up with zero. And if we compute their Lie brackets, we find that the Lie bracket of X and Y is Z. The Lie bracket of X and Z is minus two X. And the Lie bracket of Y and Z is two Y. So this definition satisfies the Jacobi identity and is skew symmetric. And so this is an example of a, a Lie algebra. So home Lie algebras came to a realization or after the studies of uh, some Lie algebras. Uh, this first study was done by Hartwig, Lashon, and Silvestrov, who is in our midst uh, today, Sergei. And uh, they were studying uh, the formations of Lie algebras and their discretizations. And this gave a concept of generalizing uh, uh, Lie algebras. So from the Lie algebras, uh, what changes is that they introduce a new map uh, known as the, a twist normally, or a linear map, and which gives us this definition. So again, we start with a vector space together with a bilinear multiplication or what we refine as the Lie product or the Lie bracket. And then we add a twist. 
So this twist comes into the identity here, which now is called the home Jacobi identity. So we still have the skew symmetry retained, but we change the Jacobi condition into a home Jacobi condition. So you see if this linear map is identity, so we'll have X here, we'll have Y here, sorry. And we'll have Z here. So this means that we will go back to the Jacobi identity that we have before. So when alpha is identity, we recover our Lie algebra, but usually alpha may not be identity. So we build a bigger class of such algebras, which are now known as the home Lie algebra. So this is the first article that uh, I, I give us a footnote there. So some more definitions. If all, if for all x, y in a vector space, if this multi, this bilinear multiplication is zero, we refer to such algebras as a, a billion. So whether they are homely or early, they are called a billion. So in the same concept, we can also define subalgebras. So a subalgebra must inherit the properties of the algebra so that this uh, bilinear product, you still end up in the subalgebra or the subspace. And uh, the linear, if you do this linear uh, compositions, you still end up again in the subspace. And in particular, this subalgebra is an ideal if you, you you do this uh, multiplication for all elements in our subalgebra and now all elements in the bigger space V, you should end up in the, in the ideal, just the usual way we define ideals. So there are other definitions for uh, some classes of formula algebra. If you give restrictions on alpha, so alpha is a morphism, in a way that it preserves the Lie bracket or the bilinear bracket. We call that algebras home Lie, multiplicative home Lie algebra. And if we give other stronger conditions that alpha is itself an automorphism, that is it's invertible and also a morphism, then we refer to this algebra as regular. regular. So this kind of uh, using uh, alpha as a uh, morphism uh, gives rise to a homely algebra naturally by what is called a Ayao twist. So if you start with a Lie algebra, as we defined before, so a vector space and a Lie bracket, and then you define alpha as a Lie algebra homomorphism. So that means it preserves this bracket in this way. So if we introduce a new multiplication by twist in this bracket, so since it's a homomorphism, it means we can still take it inside the bracket or bring it out since it's a morphism. So this new definition of the vector space and the new bracket and alpha gives us a homely algebra. So the proof is ideally, if you substitute these conditions in the home Jacobi identity, you are guaranteed to, to get uh, satisfy the home Jacobi identity since you started with the Lie algebra. Yeah, so I'm moving forward, I'm not going so fast. So if you are in a finite dimensional space, uh, we define what we refer to as equations of uh, structure constants. And uh, these are just coefficients of, uh, of this uh, associated to this uh, multilinear or bilinear product and the linear space inside V. So we know that uh, this bilinear product, it takes us back to the vector space. So it means that uh, we end up with such linear combinations and also alpha, which is a linear map, it still takes us back to the vector space. So we end up with an element which can be expressed as a linear combination in this basis element. 
So these coefficients are related to the bilinear map. We denote them by Cijs. And the coefficients related to the alpha map, we denote them by AIT. So they are the ones that are referred to as structure constants. So why do we need them? Uh, they help us to approach this problem in the as a variety or for each formula algebra we can uh, therefore speak about their varieties. So if we go back to the home Jacobi identity, which I write again, and we substitute uh, this using this structure constant as we have defined, we end up with a system of polynomial equations uh, generally <coughs> for an n-dimensional homely algebras. So it means that for each homely algebra, we can identify a system of polynomial equations and uh, the solutions to these polynomial equations uniquely define uh, these homely algebras. So this gives us a leading into defining the variety. And so since we have uh, this Cijs uh, brought up by the bilinear map and the Aijs brought up by the linear map alpha, uh, they are embedded in a space uh, total into n squared n minus one over two plus n squared because the bilinear map is skew symmetric. So it contributes this number of structure constants, C, I, J, K. And the linear map, uh, it contributes to n squared, which is like the dimension of uh, n linear, n linear transformation. So this gives us a definition of a variety contributed from this structure constants. So the structure constants, the Cijs and the Aijs determine a sub variety which sits in K, this uh, n squared n plus one over two, which is just the sum of these two defined by the system of uh, polynomial equations that uh, we have already derived up there. So long as skew symmetry. So, so this structure constant for Cijs they inherit this property of skew symmetry in this manner. So for example, C12 here, if I have one, two down here, it's just minus two, one down here, but I'll be giving specific examples. So we denote this set. So the solution space of these polynomial equations define a variety which we denote by H L N for some n-dimensional homely algebras. So on the variety, uh, the homely algebras are seen as points on the variety because if you give, if you have a, a homely algebra, it uniquely has this structure constants and this structure constants sit on the variety as points, of course, along with some particular choice of uh, basis. So in the variety, we can define some group actions uh, and this, uh, G or G actions uh, for G sitting in GLNK. So this is a linear group, the group of such invertible matrices, if you can say. So this group acts on the algebraic varieties, affine, I should say affine varieties of homely structures by the so-called transport of structure action. So if you start with a, an algebra, homely algebra, so allow me use mu for the Lie bracket. In general, we can use mu. This is a bilinear product and the linear map alpha. We can have some f uh, from g or uh, so now the, to define the action. So this action is defined in two ways. So the first way, the action on the, uh, by linear product is defined like this. Maybe I should have some two dots here. So this is like a morphic action. And then the second action on the alpha is a, a more a conjugate, conjugate action. So this action help us to see how do we move from one point to another on the variety. 
So points that lie on the same uh, orbit are considered to be equivalent and uh, we define the orbit of such uh, an algebra on the variety in just in the usual way that two points lie on the same orbit if we can uh, if an action can transport us from one point to the other or the other way around since f is invertible so the orbits on the variety they are in one to one correspondence with equivalence classes of the algebras now in the vector space. So uh, people can approach this in two ways. Maybe one way you classify them geometrically, and the other way you can also classify them just as vector spaces alongside some choice of, uh, of basis. And the change of basis matrix is actually this, this action uh, which we refer to as F. So two homely algebras we are, are said to be isomorphic to each other uh, if their corresponding structures or their corresponding structure constants lie on the same orbit on the variety. So there is that equivalence uh, in this uh, isomorphism problems. So this leads us to the definition of uh, isomorphisms in homely algebras. Just write it nicely. So if you have a homely algebra uh, together with its linear, uh, bilinear multiplication and linear, two of them, I'm sorry, this should be H2. So such F is an isomorphism. If first of all, it satisfies two conditions. One, it's an algebra isomorphism. This means that it must preserve the bilinear product. And two, it must obey this commuting relationship which is represented in the following diagram. So if either of the conditions fails, then they are known. They are considered to be non-isomorphic. So I just thought maybe I should give an example to explain the, the, the theories that I've talked about. So consider two homely algebras, H1 and H2. So the first one up here is H1, and the second one here is H2, just to have a, not the difference, so I choose, the first one is, they are three dimensional, so the first one has basis E1, E2, and E3. The second one has basis F1, F2, and F3, and their structure constants. The first one, we have C1, C2, C, the Cs, and the other one has Ds. Then the alpha map for the first one is given in this way, and the alpha map for the second one is given in this way. So these are the structure constants but now specified it's zero, one, zero, one, and the rest. So we claim that uh, these two uh, algebras are isomorphic to each other. Of course, these are parameters uh, in our field, so there are infinitely many such algebras here and infinitely many such algebras here. But maybe we want to ask a question, when are they isomorphic or can we find some points lying in the same orbit, something like that? And it's true, we can be able to find some function rho, or what we are calling as f. I just chose to call it rho because already we have some f's here. And this is given as uh, defined in this manner. So we can change our basis from the first algebra. So rho of e1 is f3, rho of e2 is f1, and rho of e3 is f2. So this is an invertible map. So the first condition is satisfied rho of alpha one is rho two of alpha. And in the second condition, so for the bilinear brackets to be preserved or for the mu to be preserved, then we have that uh, the structure constants must be related as follows. So this means that uh, you can you can transport this structure constants in this way. You can move from the first algebra to the second algebra under this isomorphism only by fixing these structures in this way. So a specific example without these Cs and Ds. So we see that this algebra that sits in H1 is isomorphic to this one that sits in H2 because this structure constant is the first one here and it is equal to 
minus D133, which is here. The same way with the rest, C131 is here, and this is equal to minus this one. So as, as algebras or as a vector spaces with the basis elements, we can see that these two are isomorphic. And uh, looking at the varieties, we can actually associate these points uh, to be lying on the same orbit if and only if uh, this condition is satisfied on the structure constants. Yeah, so in general, uh, the way we can do this uh, construction of isom isomorphisms in home Lie algebras, not on the variety, but on the vector space, uh, what we have done, I'll give a reference later. We start with uh, a Jordan canonical form of alpha. So say for some particular class, because doing this in general for alpha uh, may not give uh, immediate uh, results. So it's good to build to build them in classes. So we, we then generate homely algebras because we can write up these polynomial equations, just solve and get uh, uh, the varieties, or I would say this, the structure constant C, I, J, and the rest. And then after we've done this, we proceed now to find all the isomorphism classes. And this is done by finding such an appropriate change of basis matrix or such a, an isomorphism, uh, a, a row that we have just given above. And uh, if such exists, then we start building up our classes. And if they don't exist, then we, we separate them and put them in different classes. And then the canonical representatives in these classes are given again by trying to reduce the structures or the structure constants. So probably try to make some zero or try to make some one so that we kill some of them. But if it is impossible, we just leave them and we end up with a, we end up with a parametric uh, representation of such uh, representatives. So like for this example, in this homely algebra with alpha given in this form, uh, we cannot kill this parameter further. In other words, if you change this, you end up with a, an anisomorphic class. So we just have a representative uh, presented in this way, containing such uh, infinitely many non-isomorphic uh, members. But some cases you can reduce this further maybe so that you don't have a parameter remaining in your canonical representative. Okay, so the next uh, question that comes up, we have seen the way we define our home Lie algebras is that you start, the first property is Q-symmetry, and then the next property is home Jacobi identity. But now we can ask, uh, can we always achieve the home Jacobi identity? Because an algebra that does not, uh, that does not uh, satisfy home Jacobi identity, but only satisfy the Q-symmetry condition, they are known as Q symmetric algebras. But so can we turn them? So that's why can we turn them into a homely algebra by making them satisfy the home Jacobi identity? So this can only happen if we can find an appropriate linear map alpha that can satisfy the home Jacobi identity. And then this leads us to this definition of what we refer to as homely structures. So homely structures, which will denote by homely mu. So this is just the space of all linear endomorphisms uh, that satisfy the home Jacobi identity for some skew symmetric algebra, uh, say L. And uh, these linear maps, because they are linear endomorphisms, uh, they are, so they form a, a vector subspace. And uh, so we, we can be able to track whether the dimension of the vector subspace or if it exists for some non-trivial a linear map, because if you have a linear map which is zero everywhere, then you're guaranteed that you'll always satisfy home Jacobi identity, but we may want a non-trivial one as we try to construct this homely algebras. So we we'll start with two-dimensional uh, skew symmetric algebras. 
So actually, all two-dimensional skew-symmetric algebras are homely algebras. First, because they immediately, if you put them in the home Jacobi identity, it will always hold for any alpha. And secondly, they have been known to be Lie algebras always. So any two-dimensional skew-symmetric algebra is a Lie algebra. And all Lie algebras, of course, they are examples of home Lie algebra. So that uh, uh, finishes uh, our proof. Uh, what about three-dimensional? So three-dimensional skew-symmetric algebras can also be converted into home Lie algebras. And it's interesting that uh, the dimension of this, so this is the dimension of these linear endomorphisms. Uh, is bounded be, uh, below at six and can go up to maximum of nine. But we realize here you can take any linear map. Any linear map can make a home Lie algebra from here. But here there is some uh, bounding below. And uh, the way we uh, prove this is that uh, we rewrite again our system of linear equations that I had given earlier. But the idea is that you rewrite them, because remember they, they were cubic polynomials. So we try and separate the AITs because the AITs, they are structure constants for the linear map. So we try and separate the linear from the bilinear. So what we remain with here, it represents the skew symmetric part because uh, these are from the, uh, by, uh, the bilinear map. And if we rewrite this in uh, specifically for, for three dimension, we end up with a, a homogeneous system of equations, which is uh, underdetermined. We end up, actually we end up with a three equations in nine unknowns. And so, of course, from that, from linear algebra, that guarantees us solutions, infinitely many solutions, and uh, the homely algebras are realized for this dimension because the, the alphas sit in the kernel of this linear transformation. And from nullity rank theorem, we can be able to bound this dimension between six and nine from here. Yeah, so it's good to have an example again. But back to our early example, which was a Lie algebra. But uh, the question is, how do we turn it into a home Lie algebra? Or what alphas do we throw in to give us a home Lie algebra? And we realize that uh, the dimension of such alphas is of dimension six. And uh, directly from computations, we see that this alpha looks like this. So some, because this is a linear map, maximum dimension should be nine but there are some parameters that are killed, like this here, C T is equal to twice this. So this one also is equal to twice this, and this one also is equal to this. So some three parameters are killed and we remain with only six parameters. So the dimension of such linear endomorphisms that, that turn a simple Lie algebra into a home Lie algebra is actually dimension six, just as an example. But in four dimension now, not everything uh, turns out to be a home Lie algebra. So you can start with, you can find some skew symmetric algebra, but in turn it does not turn out to be a home Lie algebra. And we get an example of a non Lie algebra uh, given in this form, because now in four dimension, we have uh, a lot because we have to get all this by linear products, and we have six ways. But if you try to find some alpha that will turn it to a homely algebra, that alpha is only the zero map, which we don't want because we want, actually we want non-zero maps. Yeah. So probably as I, I nearly conclude, the last proposition we have, if you start with two skew symmetric algebras, which are isomorphic to each other, then you can therefore also 
immediately see that their home Lie structures are isomorphic to each other. So this the space of such endomorphisms are isomorphic to each other. And uh, the idea is that you define these home Lie structures as conjugates to one another. So you start with, uh, so since they are isomorphic to each other, we define F to be such an isomorphism. So let alpha sit in this uh, uh, home Lie structure space. Let beta sit in the second algebra space. So since F is an isomorphism, we are guaranteed that for every element in, the, in L, we can always map it to a unique element in, in L bar. So using this information and with appropriate substitutions, uh, we can actually show that if you start with a, an homely structure here, then the homely structures in the next algebra here are actually isomorphic to it. So we first claim that this is a homely structure. So it, it means that uh, it satisfies the home Jacobi identity, of course. So we try to ask, will this also satisfy the home Jacobi identity? And that is true because uh, when we substitute here, well, it looks a lot, but the, the idea is just to substitute from this claim. We find that uh, this is an expression of home Jacobi identity in the second algebra. And then with substitutions, and since F is an isomorphism, uh, we end up with this expression. And this expression inside here is just the home Jacobi identity expression in L. But since we had claimed that alpha is already here, so it means that this is zero. And therefore F of zero is just zero. So if I go back, so it means that it is enough to work with the representatives of such schismatic algebras to, to describe they are homely structures because the isomorphism uh, property uh, is, is inherited in a way. So this has recently also helped in trying to understand the four-dimensional homely algebras because as we have seen before, not all schismatic algebras are homely algebras in four dimensions. So uh, we are prone to look at this uh, representatives of four-dimensional complex Lie algebras. They exist in literature, like in this work here. So it was easy to pick the, all the classes and the representatives and try to find alpha that converts them into a home Lie algebra and look at the dimension of such alpha. So we find this proposition that if you start with a Lie algebra, four-dimensional Lie algebra, complex Lie algebra, then the dimension of the space of such alphas is actually bounded below at nine and achieves the maximum possible uh, 16. Yeah, so that is uh, all that I wanted to just share with us today. It's part of my, what I'm working on, this home Lie algebras. And, uh, there are some few references on this. Some have put them on the footnote and a few more that uh, can be also interesting as we, to read around this area. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, seems you are muted. Jared? Yeah, so there's a way we can always uh, clap. Uh, I think there's some sign here on reactions, and then we should actually give Elvis um, a big round of applause. Um, uh -huh. thank, thank you, you. very much. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think it's time for questions. I don't know. I think we should, uh, the floor is yours. If you want to ask a question, please uh, go ahead. Uh, maybe I should. Actually, I have. Okay. I, uh, uh, thank you, Jared. Mm -hmm. I have one question. I wonder if uh, um, if there is a time limit for those presentations. It was never said. Shall we put some time limit 
for the future, maximum 60 minutes or something like that. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was never said, but it was, it, uh, it, sh it should be one hour. The, the whole talk should last within an hour. That's our hope because uh, we have different connectivities in Africa. So it would be very nice to have short talks and precise. They are always nice. Um, so maybe I will uh, also go and uh, maybe I should ask a question, uh, Elvis. Uh, you talked about these algebraic varieties associated to homely algebras. So do you know some properties which are associated to them? Like are they connected, are they smooth? What are they? I mean, do, is there any information about them? Yes, so like I said in homely algebras, probably there is no much literature, but I can get some from Lee algebras. And what they have done, they look at this, they define some orbital closures on them. And then just to try and get some irreducible components, then I think from there it is easy to, uh, maybe for specific cases, try and uh, get some more other properties. But so far what I've seen is just people are interested in their irreducible components, kind of. So they do this, the risky closures on them and yeah, and more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anything is specific is an important class of of Lie algebra and the small purple one when it comes to this variety, this algebraic variety. Is there any specific result or I don't know any simple example that we can see? I mean, on a specific subclass of Lie algebra or only algebra. Uh -huh. Yes, on Lie algebra, yes, there is a match, uh, of course, and also there is a reference I've given. Uh, somewhere towards the end on these orbital closures of four dimensional Lie algebras. Yeah, so Lie algebras, yeah, they have, they have been done up to dimension seven actually. For Lie, for Lie algebras? Yes, for Lie algebras. This, this, this connection with algebraic varieties. So, yes. do you remember any example of like dimension two or three? Uh, Oh, sorry. Can we unmute? Uh, because I just unmuted everybody such that we can. Yes. And can we everyone unmute? Or I just need to go ahead and unmute everyone. I just unmuted such that people could ask uh, questions. But I can go ahead and unmute everyone. Yes, so. Yeah, so in response to Leila, uh, Okay, all I could say is that uh, maybe I've not delved deeper into the variety side because I've been classifying from the vector space side. We've been, yeah, so I think there are some, there's some more, maybe some more deep um, examples and all that. If you check out maybe the, the reference of them, maybe you could see uh, some, probably some few, more examples, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, do we have some more questions? More questions? Um... Sorry, I have a very nice question. So, uh, so you did mention something about a group action, and you talked about orbits. And I guess it's related to the first question. Uh, this orbit, are they, are they just uh, points, or what, what's, do they have any kind of just do they have any kind of structure that you could utilize for, or say something more about? Yeah, sure, sure. So on the on the variety, this affine variety. So the orbits. It's their, their orbit of points. So like uh, in three dimension, uh, it, it sits in an affine variety, let's say K18, right? So you have a, so you have a point, you have a, 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 an orbit of such coordinates. So if you can transport, or if you can move from one coordinate to another, then they lie in the same orbit on this affine variety. Yeah, so they are just points. So the orbit contains points. 
So those points are structure constants that define the home Lie algebra. Yeah, so you can go further and now study the, maybe the closures as I was saying, or if you want to, uh, or the degenerates, people do that, which, which orbits or which points degenerate, which points on the orbit and all that, yeah. Yes, but they are just points on the variety, on the, on the orbit. Yeah. 